it all sort of changed when I was 20 and my mum was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer. So within four months, she just, you know, no, was no longer there. And so that was just never anything that I ever ma imagined happening that kind of changed the trajectory of my life since then. And so that's the reason why I do what I do and and that I am who I am now. I've, I really value health and really value kind of just living well because I know that, you know, it doesn't last forever. I know that life is precious. This is the Life with Grief podcast the podcast that talks about and normalizes the complexities of grief, life after loss, and all this entails, and so much more. I want you to think of this podcast as a safe space where I'm a friendly face, and we're just journeying through this together to figure out how to live life with our grief in tow. I'm your host, Tara Accardo. I'm a grief and transformational life coach, and I'm here to serve you guidance, support, tangible coping tools, inspiration, and some laughs along the way to help you cultivate a more meaningful, intentional, and beautiful life. But grieving or not, we're getting into countless topics here on the podcast, from coping with loss to self-development and so much more. I'm so grateful you're here. Let's dive right in. Hey, you guys, welcome back to the Life with Grief podcast. I'm your host, Tara Accardo. I am so honored to introduce today's guest to you all. Today, we are chatting with Gabby Georges. She is a creative grief guide and the founder of The Grief Cocoon. Gabby is a multidisciplinary artist, and the guidance and work that she provides in the grief space is inspired by her beloved mother, Samira, who she lost at the age of 20 to a rare form of cancer. Gabby supports people to creatively process, befriend, and transform their grief through creative writing, movement, rituals, and community connection. And through the Grief Cocoon, Gabby offers creative online workshops, a podcast, educational online content, a mobile community app, and one-on-one -on -one support. She is truly such a beautiful human with this amazing, calming energy that I know you are going to feel just by hearing her voice, and I cannot wait for you to join me in this conversation with her today. We are talking all about the power of creativity in processing and transforming our grief, the importance of community and connecting with others when we're grieving, and embracing grief rather than avoiding it, and of course, talking about how to even do this. I really hope you enjoy this episode today. I have no doubt you will learn so much as I did. So without further ado, let's get into it. Gabby, welcome to the Life with Grief podcast. I am so happy to have you here today. I am so touched by your story in so many ways. And when we first sort of started corresponding, I just saw so many little similarities in our experiences and just like the way that we approach grief and all of these beautiful things. So I'm just really excited for this conversation and for you to share your story, but also just talk about some really important things about grief that I think really need to be addressed. And you just have such a, like I said, just a really refreshing viewpoint on it. I love your content as well. I think that's how we really first got connected at good old Instagram. <laughs> But just so many things that you've posted have really resonated with me. In fact, one of them recently was about, and I'd love to actually touch on this in the episode today, which is why mm -hmm. I bring this up, is like really quite literally holding space for your grief. So like literally setting time aside each day to do that. I spoke about that in a recent podcast episode, but mm -hmm. I just love to hammer home the importance of that. So I'd love to get into that eventually as well. But to just kind of kick this off, I always love to have guests just tell us a little bit about themselves. Of course, we are definitely going to get into your experience with grief and loss. But yeah, just who you are, what you like to do for fun, all the good. <laughs> all the good. <laughs> Also, well, thanks so much for having me, Tara. I'm really excited to be talking to you today. Mm. And so I guess, well, I'll start with a really defining, I think, part of my life is being the youngest of four sisters. And I'm a much younger sibling. So mm -hmm. I think I was always sort of fighting to have my voice and Work. no one listened to me. So <laughs> well, that's one thing. But yeah, and then I, I was very, I guess I had a very good childhood and very good upbringing and 
my parents were migrate migrants who came to Australia in the 70s and yeah I was having I had a fairly good life you know but it all sort of changed when I was 20 and my mum was diagnosed with a rare form of cancer and then within it was like the later stages so within four months she just you know was no longer there and so that was just never anything that I ever imagined happening so that kind of changed the trajectory of my life since then and so that's the reason why I do what I do and and that I am who I am and apart from that I, I guess I now I've I really value health and really value kind of just living well because I know that you know it doesn't last forever I know that life is precious and so I love to go running I love to spend time outdoors hiking and traveling and I love connecting with people friends and family and so and writing as well is a big part of my life writing and and singing and music and so a lot of creative stuff yeah and yeah yeah so. such a creative being I love it and I definitely I actually I wanted to ask you more about the the creativity in terms of our grief and we'll definitely get to that as well but yeah I mean so just to elaborate a little bit on your mom's journey and of course just only sharing whatever you're you're mm-hmm. comfortable with as far as like the type of cancer it was, are you, can you elaborate on sort of what that was or how it, yeah. what her journey was like? Yeah. Well, it, it took a while to find, and I think that was part of the issue, but it's called duodenal cancer. And it's, I believe within the small intestine and it's kind of a really difficult spot to find. So it, they just couldn't, couldn't find it. And so she was just having trouble keeping food down and and digesting things and it took a long time to find out what it was and so it's not a it's not a well-known cancer so I think also the the treatment that was available probably yet wasn't that well researched or that well established compared to other types of more common cancers so yeah it was called the it was called duodenal cancer yeah oh Oh my gosh, that, mm-hmm. that's so crazy. So the reason I ask this question is because my mom had esophageal cancer, which of course is is known, it's not as rare, but I can definitely empathize with watching someone we love, like not being able to keep food down with my mom. Like she ended up having breathing issues because of all of this. So when did that sort of start or like when did you guys sort of start realizing her having these symptoms to when it was like diagnosed and then you know did she even do any treatment like what did that all look like yeah I think it all sort of maybe peaked at about six months well I think it was in within months of finding or getting the diagnosis but yeah she she there were times I think I, I just had like flashbacks of like yeah. kind of having to stop on the road, you know, because she needed to vomit and she was just, yeah, not, not able to, to, to digest her food. And so, but we still didn't know what it was at that time. So we would, they were doing tests, you know, cameras and things like that. And it just wasn't coming up, but she did do treatment. She went through chemotherapy and I guess through that she yeah she lost her hair and she lost a lot of weight and you know that obviously as you might know as well like it leads to a lot of fatigue and Mm. uh, just tiredness and you know not a lot of energy and my mom was just always on the go (laughs) so it was it was odd seeing her just like that and and seeing her lose weight and lose her hair it was yeah quite a physical change over time Mm. and yeah and then it was it was only four months between the diagnosis and her dying but yeah she went into palliative care as well in the last couple of months so you know in hospital and she she was there yeah so yeah um, yeah so just loss of weight loss of appetite which she already kind of was struggling with loss yeah hair loss tiredness she actually also got an infection there's water you know just I think those those things that happen everything with, on top of each other yeah 
Yeah. 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 Both of my parents had pneumonia at one point as well. Like my mom just a few months before she died. And then my dad, it was like maybe a good six or seven months before, but like they both had it at the same time at one point. And I was like, and pneumonia itself can be a little bit scary, Mm. you know, people still, you know, die from that. And so it's just, Mm. yeah. I mean, I think one of the most difficult parts as far as those of us who have lost someone to an illness or to a disease of some kind is you know, that anticipatory grief of watching them sort of lose their literally, you know, hair, Mm -hmm. you know, the the physical things for sure, but just their ability to function and and live, you know, a, Mm -hmm. a bountiful life like we're, we're used to. And so it's, it's, there's so much shock with that. And there's so much that we're trying to process, like, as we're seeing that happen and, I hate even using this word, but, you know, just like deteriorating sort of in front of us. And then, and and then they actually die and you're just like, wait, how did, and even if it, whether or not it was like a a long time or not, and I guess that's all sort of in the eye of the Mm -hmm. beholder, what people consider to be a long time or not, but, you know, and then you're just like, okay, but where did the last, like, you know, in your case, four to six months go? Like, Mm -hmm. and I, I wanted to ask you too, like, how, how was that journey for you sort of? watching this sort of going with what I'm sure was anticipatory grief for you and then how did it feel then when she when she died like was and I I I know this is so cringy for people but like was there some relief there a little bit just as far Mm -hmm. as like her being out of pain or like just talk to me a little bit about that yeah so I I think I was in denial a little bit I think Mm -hmm. along with my sisters as well because we we'd never really gone through anything like that with someone so close to us and we were still hopeful you know that there'd be something that would work (laughs) and that you know she would get better and I guess yeah eventually we realized like hey maybe this maybe she won't get better but I think I was still, because I, I guess I had to take on, we all sort of were doing a bit of caring, you know, for my mom. And, but I, I think, yeah, I was in a bit of denial as well, because I, I guess I didn't want to believe that that was going to be, we were nearing the end. Perfect. So yeah. Mm, yeah. So I didn't, I guess I was, I actually have diary entries from that time when she was getting worse and I can, I've, I've got, I guess, a record of what I was noticing at that time, like in terms of her physical changes and even her, I guess, you know, there's a personality as well that it, they're not the same person right. usually yep. when they get, when they're unwell and when they're getting worse, they, they kind of do change and Absolutely. and they, yeah. So I, I actually, I didn't, I forgot that I had been doing writing at that time I I didn't think I was but when I looked back at my journals I could see that I could and it was very raw very raw writing it was kind of like a and then when it actually happened I was still kind of writing and it was sort of when you look at back at it it's like a child writing you know I just kind of wrote things like I miss my mom or just just very basic kind of maybe it doesn't quite have the depth there that you might have now (laughs) yeah I couldn't really say anymore (laughs) I mean 20 is still baby like yeah yeah. I I couldn't really articulate anything more than that because it was so painful but when it actually happened in the moment I do remember feeling relief as as sad as 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 kind of tragic as it was, I was relieved that she wasn't in pain anymore because I knew that she was suffering. Yeah. So, you know, she was on morphine and I guess that's to reduce the pain, but she didn't have any quality of life. And so I think I, when, when it finally, when she took her last breath, I I actually, that was one of the first things I felt was like, I'm glad she's not in pain anymore. And I'm, I'm glad she's not suffering. Yeah. And yeah, I, I kind of didn't grieve the way that people expected me to. So there was a bit of concern around me and why I'm not like crying a lot or mm-hmm. I wasn't showing a lot of emotion when it in at the time when it happened. And so people were trying to force me to kind mm-hmm. of you know, they're like, it's okay to cry. and and I just I just didn't really feel like it at the time I think it was maybe I was in shock 
Oh. I was going to say this sounds a lot like shock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was in shock and, and crying just wasn't happening. Yeah, And I yeah. also, yeah, and I, I'm also not the most overly expressive person in public. Like when I'm around a lot of people, I prefer to to cry or to express myself privately, especially yeah. if I'm, you know, you just want to ugly cry and, and just kind of lose it. <laughs> <It's so fair. laughs> yeah yeah and I I felt like yeah I felt like when when there was a lot of people around it, the comforting kind of made things worse for me yes. like it sort of inter interrupted the process of actually just letting it out because yeah. people wanted to make you feel better and comfort you and wanting want you to kind of stop crying <laughs> and then it's right. like well it's like cry when we <laughs> ask you to but then <laughs> yeah. don't make us uncomfortable with your crying yeah <laughs> like I can't win can I just like yeah. have my process please like <laughs> um, yeah so yeah it was a bit people were a bit concerned that I wasn't crying enough and, yeah and, but just, I, it was okay I just had my own way of dealing with it yeah. Well, I think that's, I mean, a perfect segue into this topic is like, we, we do have our own ways of grieving and there is, I'm going to say there's no like right or wrong way and overarching there is, I, I think we would both agree that there's certainly better ways to cope and we'll get there. But yeah, I mean, it's such a beautiful example of the fact that we, we all do express our grief in different ways. And of course, people have their thoughts and opinions on that. But I actually wanted to ask you, and I'm actually really curious about this more as someone who's an only child, having, you said, so you're one of four or you have four, other, okay, so. One of four, yeah. One of four, so how, and of course, you know, I don't want you to feel like you need to divulge everything about your sisters, but just in general, like how did they grieve versus how you grieved? Because one of the reasons I bring this up that I think is really important mm -hmm. is, you know, we can all lose on paper, the same person, you all lost your mom, mm -hmm. but great example of how we can all be so individualized and in how we express, how we grieve, how we process and everything. So did all of you kind of do it a little differently from what you remember and observed, or did you, did you sort of feel like you were like <laughs> black sheep over here, not crying? Or <laughs> what did that, what did that look like? Yeah, I, I think we did have different, I, I have, I guess my oldest sister and my third oldest are a bit more similar than mm -hmm. the rest of us. My, the middle sister was kind of just choosing not to, not to really acknowledge it much, or, you know, she just wanted to pretend like life was normal. Oh. And so she wanted to still, you know, take her son out to the, I think also she, she didn't want her son to see her uh, crying and things like that so yeah. she wanted him to feel like everything was normal as well and that was her way of coping and so she'd still take her son to the movies and and do just the everyday normal things that she would normally do and people I think people could get judgmental about that as well that like sure. oh how can she do that when her mom just died you know but she just didn't have the capacity or didn't know maybe how to deal with it you know and yeah. so she just needed to distract herself and, and escape and and do other things whereas my older sister probably she really she's my, my older sister and my third youngest are very emotionally expressive and so they did a lot of crying and and you know till this day I think you know I can I can have more open conversations with them you know mm -hmm. because they I know that they are are already kind of okay with that you know I don't have the, I haven't had the same number of conversations with all my sisters about my mom right. and so I kind of you have to sort of know where people are at where, where, even if it's your family you know some might not be super comfortable with talking about the person and some might be my sister one of them has a lot of dreams about my mom mm. and so she would used to share that and then my older sister would get upset because she was like why aren't I having dreams oh mom? my gosh I've so been there with the other family members and they're just like <laughs> why aren't I getting visits like yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah. <laughs> so it, it yeah so I think I was the more kind of maybe reserved like I I, I kind of just dealt with it 
more alone I didn't really want to be around a lot of people and that wasn't positive for me because I just wanted to be alone and to process it I, I think I'm more kind of a introvert where I kind of need alone time to process yeah. things so yeah. even when we had lots of people visiting the house I would just sort of go into a room and, and sit there by myself and think about things so. yeah you're like I just need a hot 10 please yeah. just like... <laughs> yeah. so relatable. yeah yeah whereas yeah some people love that the company and the and the connection now I can appreciate it but I think yeah initially I, I needed time alone so yeah we we all had our own ways one was more just distracting herself the other two were kind of just couldn't they just had so much emotion and and just were crying a lot and they're more kind of extroverted as well so I think yeah. they might have you know in, appreciated having company and then sure. I was just sort of more I need time by myself and just a, yeah space yeah. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. And thank you for elaborating on that because yeah, like I just, one of the things I'm so like passionate about is spreading just more awareness and acceptance of how people choose to express their grief. Mm -hmm. And I've definitely had comments in my time from people that imposed their opinions and their, or they either thought I wasn't talking about it enough or actually more than anything now is probably the opposite. They probably are just like, <laughs> wow, you talk about it a lot. And I'm just like, yes, I do. Because this has been very cathartic for me, actually. <laughs> and it really yeah. has helped me cope and, and make mm. sense of it and understand it and navigate it. Like losing a parent, you you feel very lost. You can feel very alone, even though you might have siblings. You mm. can feel very confused. You lost your mother at a very pivotal time in your life too, being as young as you were. And so actually, okay, so I, I want to get into the work that you do, but I would actually love to know, like, how do you, maybe not how do you, do you feel like losing your mom at the age of 20 impacted sort of just your, your now adulthood, getting into adulthood? Like, mm -hmm. how do you feel like that is maybe, you know, just, yeah, impacted you overall? Oh, yeah, it has. It, it's had I a feel like, where do I start? <laughs> yeah. I know, that's a I tough think, question, yeah. sorry. <laughs> no, I think, you know, grief impacts all parts of your life and one is friendships I think with relationships I kind of and I think you know even being a, an older person losing someone you can relate to this where it's like you nest you can't really relate to people complaining about mundane things you know and so mm -hmm. or about their the, parents who is still very exactly much alive and just annoying them I'm like at least you have one <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so I I had a best friend at the time who used to complain a lot about her family and mm -hmm. I just couldn't deal I couldn't tolerate it anymore and so we kind of drifted apart and yeah. and you know it because no one I knew had gone through the same thing it is pretty isolating so I was really I tried to google you know places or groups where I could go and talk to people about it but I also didn't find what I was looking for and I, I didn't necessarily want you know counseling or therapy mm -hmm. it was more just a social space where people yeah. were okay to talk about grief you know and that's quite oh. hard to find yeah so yeah, I had maybe one friend who till today will still check in on me, a high school friend. And so I think it actually showed me like, oh, okay, who it really highlights who's really there for you in the hard times and who's just there for the good times. And yeah. and then you kind of see where people's values are. Like you can kind of, it highlights what really matters. And so for me, I I was studying psychology at the time. I was finishing my undergrad degree actually I graduated yeah while my mom was in hospital and and then after that I just thought well actually I really want to study music and and that kind of even motivated me even more to do that even though my parents didn't necessarily support me yeah. <laughs> in that because they were like music you know you can't make a living out of music yeah yeah be sensible you know so it actually just really until today really gave me more of a want and a desire to to really live how I believed I wanted to live like oh, according to my values and according to my 
true kind of desires. Whereas like before I was just very sheltered. I was very living a pretty comfortable life. And I think that kind of just shattered everything, you know, losing my mom was just something I never imagined happening even though we're, we all we're all human and right. but I just not, didn't not that early certainly yeah. like man I thought we may, might have had a few more years like <laughs> yeah yeah ideally so, yeah, my, to like our 40s or 50s even or you know like quote-unquote normal yeah. like yeah we got, we yeah. got so, for sure yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah relationships in terms of what I do for work now I really just followed my curiosity because I just thought I don't actually, you know, want to do anything I don't want to do. Like I I don't want to oh. be stuck in a in a job that doesn't mean anything to me or where I'm just wasting my life and wasting my time and so everything I sort of I've created in my life so since then has really been something I find meaning in and I I'm it's all about connecting back to my mom as well because I I've developed a different relationship with her, you know. Yes. I realized that okay, she's not here physically in the same way that she was, but I can still find ways to, to connect with her and to, to yeah, have that relationship. And so she still kind of, I still remember her words that, you know, I was lucky enough to, to receive that, you know, she was very wise. And so I still kind of, that still guides me. And, and I think now I'm in a way, I don't think I would be who I am or, have the life that I have without that loss and as much as we we want to have that person back I also don't want to be that person that I was you know so it's like it's it's really yeah That's, that's trippy that's like a very I can understand how that might like mess people up or be like wait what are you talking about like but there really is something to be said I resonate with what you said so much. You have no idea, but it really is like, it sounds like you were going down this path, like you said, of maybe like a job that didn't or wouldn't kind of let you up and just sort of everything, not everything, but you were going in a direction where it was maybe a little bit like against your, your soul's purpose and like what you might be really meant to do here. And like, it is so clear you are a very creative being and all of, and you know, it's, it's tricky. Cause I've, I've had people ask me this too, as far as like, you know, do you think that, you know, not like your parents had to die in order for you to like get into this work, but like, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on that? And I'm like, listen, I guess I don't really know. I, I mm-hmm. sort of think there's some divine plan in a way. Guess I'm not really sure jury's still out, but like, <laughs> it's interesting to ponder. So you know, it's sort of just like, well, if these were my circumstances and this is the loss I apparently was supposed to have or go through. You are just, a, again, a beautiful example of like, okay, what can I make of that? And how can I live in my truest and highest self while doing that? And okay, this is actually a beautiful segue into the work that you do. So, you know, you are a grief guide, you created the grief cocoon. So talk to me just a little bit about sort of how all of that came to fruition it was this throughout your 20s like just walk us through mm-hmm. sort of how you got to building this mm-hmm. beautiful community that you have now yeah so I I think I mentioned that I was I started looking for spaces where I could meet other people yeah. and have open conversations about grief and I didn't find them and so eventually I started just sharing I I guess after three or four years I started to actually write poems and songs that were okay enough to share because I had done some processing because before that it was just kind of like raw material and I I I couldn't offer anyone anything with that but I once I after three or four years I figured out that oh okay I'm starting to write things that actually might mean something to other people and I can where I'm sharing my experiences and insights and maybe it's it's actually worth sharing so I I did actually start sharing it and through that I connected with people who were also grieving and then I realized oh I'm not alone that was actually the point where I realized I'm not alone when I started to share my work and people started responding yeah and so yeah it all started with actually with spaces with open mics where people would come open mics centered around grief (laughs) and people would just 
That is yeah. not, a, I'm sorry to interrupt you. That is like not a thing around me. And I am very upset about it now. And it really, America needs to like get it together because I've <laughs> never heard of that happening here. And I'm, I'm here for it. I'm sorry. Continue with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, that I, my amazing. first event, yeah, it was like okay, 40 yeah. people showed up to this local space. It was a rehearsal space. It wasn't even like an event space or anything. And people shared their poetry and I eventually had people sharing songs or even you know just things that they created and stories and I was just amazed because half the people that were there I just had no idea who they were and so it was like oh people actually want need this or people actually yeah want want to share and talk about grief and so that eventually led to workshops and led to other sort of events, different types of events where, you know, we had movie nights where people, I would play, actually a lot of them were animation movies that had some that. reference to either death or grief or the afterlife. It was really yeah. cool actually. And then we'd have a conversation about the movie afterwards. Oh my God. So, I'm and that was actually it. that, yeah, that came from a community member at the time. And so I kind of just, respond to what people want but also I've got I guess a lot of things I'd like to put out in the world and so yeah a lot of creative writing workshops I worked with other artists around like animation we had uh, movement sound I've done yeah just just different types of workshops creative workshops where people could process grief and share with each other and connect and so that's it all started because I needed that space and then I realized oh there are other people out there who also need that space. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey, my friend, are you needing some relief from your grief? If so, I have an exciting new offering coming really soon that will help you get exactly that. My 14-day Relief in Your Grief Challenge brings you powerful, impactful, bite-sized daily content alongside the perfect meditation. One of the biggest struggles I hear from my members, clients, and people on social media is that they just need some relief from the stress, sadness, and pain that grief and loss can cause. But here's the thing. So many people are lost and unsure about where to start. This can feel like a huge thing to tackle, so we are doing it together and we're starting with just 14 days. Give me two weeks and I will help you begin to take that anxiety, heartache, and anguish and turn it into peace, clarity, and hope as you move forward with your grief. Seriously, what do you have to lose by joining? Challenge your grief and give yourself some relief, my friend. I have no doubt this 14 days will be an inspiring, uplifting, perspective-changing experience for you. My mailing list will be the first to hear about when this challenge is live. Join now through the link in the show description. It's that whole like, you know, if you can't find it, create it or build it or you know, mm. whatever. Yeah. 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 Oh my God. Yeah. How, how beautiful. So how do you feel? Cause I know like one of like your, your whole pieces of what you have built is like using that creativity, using this creative outlet to help. I don't want to say like maybe with your healing journey, but just really transforming in your grief. So how do you feel like whatever it is, writing, singing, which I cannot do to save my life, music, poetry, anything like how, how has that helped you? And how have you seen that, you know, impact and help other grievers as well? This is, yeah, there's so much. I've actually written a thesis about this. <laughs> Have you? But, uh, <laughs> All right, let's dig into that. I, I, no, there's, there's probably, honestly, there's probably so many benefits to it that I can't even, yeah. Yeah. I, dig into that, well, but. my thesis was about poetry and performance and community events. So, and that impact on grief. But oh, I, I guess it. to begin with, just talking about the actual creative process, it really helps you take what's in your head and reflect it back to you like you, you you're actually looking at it you know if you're writing you're you're kind of looking at on on the page you can see what you've been experiencing and so already that kind of gives you greater self-awareness yes and and insight into your own experience and into your own thought process and feelings and that like awareness as well can also be really useful yeah. When you're going through grief, 
And then apart from that, you know, it's it's actually, yeah, it's take, taking something internal and making it external. So you're kind of transforming your experience into something and into something a lot of times of beauty, you know, like I know, I guess I don't think there's enough people that talk about like the impact of having beauty around you. And, and when you yeah. make a poem or when you sing or when you paint, you know, some people right. paint their grief, it really that beauty can really actually have an impact on you and and it, it's been shown to calm your nervous system and to relax you and to reduce stress and even, you know, spending time in nature as well, which I'm really big on, that has a similar effect where you're, you're already, you're kind of just, it just eases all your all the things that come up for you yeah. in, in grief and and it it allows you and and also like sharing with other people or hearing other people's stories really gives you another way to look at things yes that's one thing that's and great. unexpectedly yeah i i found that hearing other people's stories doesn't just make you feel less alone but it actually also gives you another option for how to deal with things because you're hearing how mm-hmm. someone else is dealing with it and so your trans it's like a transfer of information as well and and another way of you know learning how to live with grief and so that was one thing I really was surprised by because I'm like oh it's not just knowing that you're not alone but it's also kind of learning from other people's insights and also being exposed to different ways of of dealing with grief and dealing with loss and you know apart from that you can it's such a great way to honor your your the person that you've lost or the people that you've lost you can yeah. write about them as much as you want or you can sing about them or you can dance about them I've had I've had someone dance as well or actually someone improvised a song in one in one of the events that is, <laughs> about his that mom takes so much skill that I simply do not have oh my god I love yeah. it <laughs> He was a, an artist, a visual artist and a that musician. So, so cool. <laughs> but yeah, it, it's, it's a great way to, you know, give yourself permission to actually talk about the person, to share yeah. stories about the person, memories, you can capture memories and then look back at them when you're feeling, yes. when you feel like, oh, you're feeling pretty sad. You can look back at, at the memories that you've captured or dreams, you know, you can write down your dreams. I just, yeah, there's, there's so many different benefits to it, but those are just a few. Yeah. So many different outlets. And I love what you said. So I definitely, I mean, I, my dad was very artistic. I joke that I, I didn't get any of it, honestly. <laughs> I, but you know what? The thing is, it doesn't have to be perfect, right? You can just, you can try mm-hmm. the, the whole point is getting it out there. But what I will say is writing is definitely big for me and journaling has been mm-hmm. a massive part of my healing journey and shifting my mindset and all of the things. And so when you just said about, you know, putting those thoughts on paper and sort of having them reflect back on you, Mm -hmm. I swear that is when some of the biggest aha moments come because those are your honest thoughts right there, (laughs) staring, (laughs) staring back at you and you you can't escape them. But I also Mm -hmm. love that too, because, and this definitely was a big thing for me, like at night when I I had a lot of ruminating thoughts and Mm -hmm. just a lot of things going on in here, being able to just either put it on paper or I would actually sometimes use like a voice note. So like, like I said, I can't sing, but I did like, I'll just talking it out literally with myself, which sounds so sad, but it was very therapeutic and just like releasing that to literally Mm -hmm. anywhere else other than Mm -hmm. our brain than in here can be so, yeah, just, just calming. It just like puts it somewhere else just for a moment. And like you were saying, kind of gives us permission Mm -hmm. to just you know, take a deep breath and process it all. But I will say like with painting and things too, I mean, just like the calming effects of that. Can you like elaborate on, on that? I'd like, I don't know. Have you seen that type of like art form and what has sort of come from that for people? Well, I tried it myself <laughs> once. And how did that go? And I'm not a painter, but then my <laughs> sister insisted on putting it up on the wall, which was embarrassing. Oh, but I um. That. But basically, I just I think the physicality of it was really therapeutic. Yeah, like it's just, very calming. Like you're just you kind of like zone out a little. Almost. I did at least. Like, <laughs> but I, I think actually I did the opposite where I just I was using like black paint or really dark oh, green yeah, yeah. and just 
It was kind of like, it looked yeah. like a bit of an angry, well, you know, you can actually get a lot of anger out as well when yes. you're doing something physical. So it's sort yeah. of like you can do, you can use it in any way that you want. You can use it to to calm yourself. But also if you if you have a lot of anger or frustration or, yeah. Great point. I don't know, like there's so many. It might not always emotions. be sadness. Yeah. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like- yeah. You can really, it, the physicality of like just picking a color and just going hard on the paint. Yeah, it's really therapeutic. So I I would recommend it. It doesn't matter that if you're an artist, I yeah. I'm not a visual artist at all. And it was just actually I realized like it's the creative process itself is more important yeah. than the outcome. Yes. It's it's not about how other people judge your work or or whether it's up to scratch compared to other people. It's it's more about actually the outlet, like the yeah. the catharsis and the just having a vehicle to express what's happening inside because you know you as you might know like it just bottles up and if you don't let it out it will really it can impact you in so many different ways and it can become self-destructive as well because if you're trying to suppress it and pretend it's not there it it will come out and it'll still be there it doesn't disappear it just comes out in unwanted ways <laughs> yes yes very yeah. very much yeah like I said you know we talked briefly about you know as far as there's there's better ways to cope and some not mm. so better ways to cope so one of the things too that I wanted to touch on that I know is also very important to you as far as and you you're welcome to bring in like the art or the you know writing piece to this is you know really just embracing our grief as opposed to you know avoiding it mm. so just talk to me a little bit about that. Just your your viewpoint on that, and just how people can can better do that. Obviously, we've talked a lot about like through an art form, but if there's anything mm-hmm. else you want to elaborate, just as far as embracing our grief, because I think this is a really important topic to talk about because a lot of people don't want to embrace their grief, or you know, because it's painful, because it hurts, mm-hmm. because it's sad, because it's you know, it's draining, which is all completely understandable. But what you were just saying about, you know, if we don't, it can really catch up with us, I think is a really important takeaway from this conversation today. So Mm. yeah, whatever thoughts you have on that, I would love for you to elaborate. Well, I think, well, firstly, grief and loss is something that's unavoidable. You know, as humans, people have been living and dying since the, since we existed and It's and even when you look at nature, you know, there's it's just the cycle of life, and I think that's also a fact that people don't want to accept. Yeah. Uh, but there's a reason. Like grief exists for a reason, pain exists for a reason. We it gives us signals, you know, like we when we experience pain, like for example, it teaches us kind of when we burn ourselves accidentally and we pull back like that. If we didn't have that pain, we wouldn't know that fire wasn't. Right. wasn't a you know a safe thing you know so grief and and pain are there to kind of help us it's survival in a way <laughs> yeah it's it's it is it's part of survival and and it's something that we need to pay attention to because it, it can actually you know and one thing I I really advocate is is just like let grief change you because I think mm-hmm. change is is something a part of the grief process that people don't want to accept because people are so used to kind of living their routines or living in their regular life where things are predictable and things are comfortable and things they know what's happening things are familiar whereas grief and pain and loss those scary things scary parts of life that people don't want to let impact them you know or that they don't want to deal with but I, I I would say that, you know, making space for grief, whether it's just crying, you know, like, or shouting, screaming sometimes, you know, you probably, <laughs> there's times where you just need to do that. I think you will actually, it will help you get closer to the the real, the things that truly matter. You know, I, I everyone that I've spoken to who's really leaned into their grief has shared and you know I've experienced it too where you realize that a lot of things that you worry about that you used to worry about don't really matter that much you know in the big picture it really 
Yeah, it helps you highlight, like it highlights to you who who and what really matters in life. And I think that while it is hard, you know, it, there is a lot of good as well that exists within that. And on the other side of, you know, feeling the pain and and processing the grief and expressing it, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I guess, things that you will never, you'll there's a richer life, I think, you know, that there's a, there's a, a bigger range of, of experiences that you can have in life after mm. you've experienced grief. I think you just explained it beautifully as much as anyone can. Right. But I actually had never heard anyone mention it like you just did. And I love that. Like it's a, it a, allows you, I guess, for lack of a better term, a, a wider, a bigger range of experiences. And I, I don't think people see it that way. And I can understand why, like, you know, people are like, I don't want new experiences. And if I have new experiences, I want it with the person who died. So thank you very Mm -hmm. much. I'm going to not take that advice. It's just like, okay, but like, let's take a step back because the, the thing is like life will continue to go on, unfortunately, Mm -hmm. as much as we don't want it to the same way. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's no escaping that just like, there's no escaping death. Right. So you know, it's, yeah, you, you sort of, what's the term I was going to say, evolve or die. And that's maybe, that's a very extreme way of putting that, but you know, you can either, you can either choose to embrace it or mm-hmm. you can sort of choose to live in that darkness. And I also just want to preface this, anybody here listening, mm-hmm. who's very early on in their grief mm-hmm. or, or it kind of still feels like yesterday or whatever, like it's very raw still, like, please, as always, just put all of this in the back of your head and just, you know, yeah. <laughs> these, are, these are things truly, these conversations we're having. I mean, these are the things that as difficult for me personally, as it was to hear mm-hmm. in the beginning stages of my grief, I'm glad I heard things like this, even if I didn't want to believe it at the time, even if I, whatever. And it wasn't so much about like changing my mind and making me believe these things, which is not what we're trying to do here, mm-hmm. but it's more just like planting the seeds for us to know that there there is still a full and abundant and colorful life after loss and yeah we are we are not the same person but that Mm -hmm. that's not always a bad thing and that and Mm -hmm. and we could end up living a more truer version of ourselves as you have in some Mm -hmm. weird twisted (laughs) way of getting there but you know but how incredible is that? You know, and and we know life is so precious and it is short and it can be taken from us Mm -hmm. at any moment. So why, why not live that way as much as we can, you know, and it's tough. It, that takes getting warmed up to that is, you know, that is not something I would have believed earlier on Mm -hmm. in my grieving journey, but that's why the right coping tools can help you, you know? Yeah. I actually now say like that, even the grief was a gift from my mom because oh. she was the catalyst and and so everything that's sort of come out of that pain and the and the grief has actually meant that my mom is a bigger part of my life even though she's she's not here in the same way but i think mm-hmm. and that's another perspective like you can think about okay how can i best honor the people mm-hmm. or the person that I've lost through dealing with this this grief and this pain, you know, because is there something in there that, or is, is there like some sort of thing that I can, yeah, uh, how can I make meaning out of it? I guess that's tap what into, I'm, yeah, like, yeah, you, you, you can't always make meaning out of the death itself, you know, because right. there's always a lot of, there can be a lot of injustices or a lot of things Absolutely. that, you think oh, it's not fair, and so yeah. it's not about making meaning out of the, the the death or the way the person died, but it's making meaning out of the the new, I guess, life that you that you now have yeah. to navigate through. And so, living in the reality of like them not being here physically, but then finding other ways to connect and honor them. So, that's been, I guess, an anchor for me because I I think well. I went through that because of because of my mom my mom's death and and so mm-hmm. now I can actually 
feel like I'm living more in, in my values and, and in a way that honors her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And thank you just so much too, for clarifying that difference between, you know, making meaning of our life after loss. It's not making meaning of the death because I think a lot mm -hmm. of people get really, for lack of a better term, triggered by that. They're just like, I don't want to make any, you know, meaning from the death, you know, this, this happened to me, this is really tragic. Like there's, there's no reason behind it. There's no meaning to it. And I think what you just clarified is, is perfect. And I totally agree with that. It's like, it, no, absolutely. It doesn't like we, I'm sure both feel like we should not have lost our moms as early as we did. Desperately wish that was not the case. Mm -hmm. We don't know why they got the certain types of cancer that they did. That might always be a mystery. That might always be very unsettling and mm -hmm. uh, uncomfortable to think about. And it's just like, that just freaking sucks. Like sometimes there's just no better way that I can word that. It's like that just, it doesn't feel nothing about that's going to ever really feel right. You know, it's like, okay, we can kind of get, I don't want to say hung up, but you know, we can have our focus beyond that, or we can do what you obviously have done and choose to literally also through your art, create something beautiful with it as we're, when we're carrying them with us, as we do that the best that we can, because that, what other choice do we have right now? Right there, they are gone. They are physically not here. So mm -hmm. I think what you've said is, is perfect. Like it's just finding new and different ways to connect with them, to bring them with us, to keep their memory alive, which you are doing in, in such a amazing way. And I've been very informed today and I'm actually feeling very motivated to try some of these <laughs> different <laughs> art forms, despite how they might turn out. And just to kind of wrap this up, I, yeah, and we've touched on a lot of great like coping tools and things that people can do here today, but is there any, maybe just like a couple of tips or pieces of wisdom or guidance that you would leave someone here listening who is perhaps in their earlier stages of grief, or maybe even going through some of that anticipatory grief as we both have kind of wherever they might be, you know, what can you recommend or just say to someone here who's, who's struggling a little bit? It's, it's hard because other I, than it's, just like hang in there like yeah <laughs> really yeah hang in there it's and and I would say that you know I think it's it's okay to feel whatever you're feeling because mm -hmm. I think when you don't know you don't see examples of people in their early stages of grief you just think that you're really like losing your mind and that you're not normal or <laughs> you just think Personally. that you're yeah. <laughs> but actually all of that is normal. Like that those you're in survival mode. And I, I think yeah. it's, it's, it's just worth kind of giving yourself some patience and some grace to actually feel what you're feeling and, and to, to be sad or be angry or be whatever it is that you're, you're going through because it, it, it's just part of the process. And I think yeah. that's just one thing I would say. And then as, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then if you can find a way, you know, find spaces or ways, outlets to just to express what you're going through, whether it is taking really long walks out in nature or whether it is journaling or whether it is talking to someone, mm -hmm. you know, there's, I think, well, I, I, I think grief can be, you can process grief in all kinds of ways, whether it's cooking, you know, or yeah, just doing something that, you know, or crying, you know, that's, yeah. <laughs> that's always there. So I, I think, yeah, just, just let it out. And if you need to make time for it, as I think we've mentioned at the start, do that. If you need privacy, do it, you know, in your car or wherever you can find two, 10 minutes <laughs> to just, yeah let it out you know I think it's 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 good it's good to let it out so yeah, yeah. I did mention we were going to come back to that and I think you pretty much touched on it so I won't belabor that yeah. point but I think what you just said is is great like again just five to ten minutes because and I, this is actually what I saw in your post and I was just like yeah she nailed it was mm -hmm. like you know we might have feelings or emotions or whatever come up at inopportune times or it can mm -hmm. be at work or you know we just don't have the luxury of losing it so to speak whenever we want or, or maybe we just don't yeah. want to maybe we we don't want to like you said we're saying earlier maybe we don't we're not super comfortable being that way in public whatever it is yeah so really again physically literally holding that space and doing 
whatever of the maybe the some of the things that we talked about today certainly journaling mm-hmm. i think we can both attest to that one but you know however that release sort of has to happen and then you know and it's not like we might not get tripped up in other parts of the day or we might not get triggered by something or a grief burst might make itself known but i do think and you might be able to test to this too like i think in holding that space we can better equip ourselves for when and if those do come up because mm-hmm. we we know how to handle it a little bit or we sort of maybe we got our crying session out of the way for the day and we're just like oh god here we go again but like you know it just yeah it just gives it that that space to be witnessed which is all it wants because it is Mm. trying to help us you know survive and make sense of it all so yeah exactly yeah well this is an amazing conversation I I could honestly go on for another hour with you I mean especially again like I said just so many crazy similarities between some of our stories and our sweet moms and all the things but I don't know I feel very enlightened and you just have such a beautiful energy to you so just thank you so much for sharing your story and sharing your mom with us but also I think everybody here can walk away with some really amazing tools to try you know, and just find a little relief in our grief. (laughs) Thank you so much for coming on. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Tara. I am sending you a huge thank you for tuning into today's episode, my friend. I'm so grateful you're here and for the steps you are taking to heal your heart, open your mind, fulfill your soul, learn, grow, and evolve, and move through this crazy thing called life in big, beautiful, impactful ways. Visit lossesbecomegains.com for my blog, ways to work with me, to shop my daily journal, and so much more. And be sure you're following along on Instagram and Facebook at Life with Grief Podcast. I love seeing new faces, meeting new people, hearing your stories, and supporting you however I can. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. If you haven't left a rating or review, please do so. I would so appreciate it. Or if you feel so inclined to share this episode or this podcast with someone who could use it too. I'll catch you in the next episode.